So, greeting, shalom, and welcome to Outside the Class. It's January 31st, 2023. It's the end of January already, right? We continue our Matthew series. We're on episode 25 with Death and Taxes with Tim Mackey. With this way of doing things, you can watch the video before we begin chatting. So I hope to keep these to around 15 minutes or so. Easy to catch, even easier to catch up on. And we have the Dusty Feet. We're in the How to View the Bible series, and these episodes are live each Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. In the description below are links to all of the audio, video, and source documents that we use here in the Dusty Feet. We want to make sure that any material we use here is properly credited to those folks who work so hard to bring it to us. Without their efforts, learning we do here, it does not happen. So don't forget to subscribe. Click that bell icon if you want a reminder. And as always on the Dusty Feet, this is a place where we can safely explore the endless ways of God and the incarnation of His creation, where belief understandings may be challenged, divine misunderstandings may exist, and traditional teachings might falter as we pursue connection, context, and community with God and each other here in an environment of grace and love. So here we go with some outside the class on the dusty feet. So again, and as always, it is expected that you watch the reference videos first so you can get a context for this discussion and to hear the perspective of the originator. In this case, it is Tim Mackey. I link all the videos for each week in advance on the dustybeat.com on the outside the class page. So if you have not yet, pause this, click on the link in the description below, and when you come back, we can chat. So we're back. Death and taxes. So those are two things that we often say are inevitable for us. And yet, in these two accounts, neither of them are about us. Well, maybe sort of. So, so Tim starts off, and I like this very much in the way I like to think, and that's we start with context, right? Remembering where we are in the story. Um, much of our reading of the Bible is so, it's so segmented and it's so detached that we often don't think about its context, right? The what, where, the why, when, the who, and the how, right? We're not trying to solve a crime, but this is not a fictional story. It does have context, everyone. So, um, we're traveling from Caesarea Philippi to this, the final leg of this journey that will eventually end up in Jerusalem. That's going to be their final stop. Right? It's 170 kilometers or about 105 miles from Caesarea Philippi to Jerusalem, right? So he kicks off with this death story, and it is also, again, a second time it's mentioned. So, um, oh, and we also get a quick uh, geographical update that they are, again, back in Galilee, right? So, you know, I wonder, uh, like I do on many of the stories, is what led up to this part of the story, this, this declaration, right? Were they just coming together, maybe after a nice rest from travel, maybe they're meeting for breakfast, and then Jesus blurts out, the Son of Man is going to be delivered to the hands of men, they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. I don't know about you, but <laughs> the parables and this, this third person talk, it, it can be challenging, and, and we can see why. 
remember that this is the second time this is mentioned, this declaration as well. This, remember the first time um, when Jesus brought it up, we have the rebuke of the newly renamed Peter, right? In that little famous little incident. Um, but this time we see a much more subdued disciple's reaction. Grieving. Not sure how that went. Um, what did grieving mean? Did they talk amongst themselves or did they just process it alone? Hmm. You know, I, with the first declaration, I love Tim's creativity with how he expressed that interaction between uh, Jesus and, and Peter from the Matthew 16 event, right? Um, you know, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to it again. Really listen to it, because it really does cover some much broader thinking, and I like it. It's because Jesus is trying to prepare them for what is to come, right? You know, I can't imagine what's going through G Jesus' mind. He said, you know, there is there is so much that I need to teach them. I need to help them understand, and, and there's so little time left. And Tim, he, he continually mentions, uh, and I like the term, uh, an upside-down kingdom. And the events that are going to be taking place in the relatively near future are definitely upside down to how they were expecting the, the Messiah to play out. Because we know that death, burial, and resurrection is not the expectation. We know that Passover is the time that Jesus, when he arrives at Jerusalem, this is a good chance that there will be quite a few folks on the road along the way, right? Because Jesus spent uh, a decent period of time, if we pay attention, trying to correct misperceptions, right? One could use the term addressing expectations. He is aware that they have understandings about many things through either teachings or traditions. Although, you know, traditions are teachings per se, just taught by experience. And some of those, they, they needed to be addressed. Because not all of those are bad in any way. It was how they viewed each importance. Um, he's opening the door for a lady, right? Very much a tr tradition, and it's certainly regional. To some, it's very important, and they will call another rude for not doing it. Personal importance to a tr tradition. Hmm? Yeah. So there's another thing I, I think that might be a, a misconception, and that's that the temple is bad especially in this context. Um, what we had was a temple being managed by, arguably, two types of men, corrupt and confused, right? Those that were appointed, Caiaphas and his cronies, are, of course, part of the corruption. Torah kind of points out who these men are supposed to be. The others are just so wrapped up in being in a power position that they, they probably just miss the truth. Because remember that Zacharias, that's the father of John the Immerser, was a priest serving in the temple. And he seemed like a pretty good guy to all accounts, right? So we need to remember that just being attached to the temple is not a mark of corruption. You know, we also need to continually remember that no one is getting this Messiah expectation. The leaders, not of course not, but not the following crowd, and as we know by those responses, or the disciples. Remember that. So the temple tax. How'd that hit you? What ideas leapt to mind, right? 
Because Tim does, in, in my opinion, a pretty good job painting a picture with the use of the temple graphic to talk about why the temple tax. So the temple had become so large and, and so cumbersome that the, the staff had grown, but that was by choice. You know, remember that there are no Pharisees and Sadducees in Torah. Um, in the Torah, we do have a tabernacle and a pretty detailed list of the families that were appointed to the tasks of tabernacle care. Many of those other Levite families, they became serving priests in the communities around them, all around the land. And, and some of them were even serving in those sanctuary cities. Go look those up. Uh, that's interesting. God had also laid out how all these Levites and the high priests were to be fed and cared for. You know, we don't have a temple in the land for over, I don't know, 400 years after the children of Israel entered the promised land. So the tabernacle was the place. You know, it's interesting to remember that King David, right? That man called by God as a man after my own heart. That crazy life of David and all. He still had the temple. I mean, sorry, he had the tabernacle as his place of worship. It was his 10th son, Solomon. He is the builder of the temple. David had a vision about it, and Solomon was the builder. So the support for the temple would then need to be different than that of the tabernacle, yes? But we get no real record of how that played out. But the temple is built, and God's fine with that. And it seems to run fairly well for a time. But then it developed into a business. Can you hear the echoes of the church in this? Teachers were a labeled commodity. Pharisees, Sadducees, they were just part of those taxing the system. Are we really different today? Be honest, mirror handy. We have our own Pharisees, Sadducees, and probably many others we could add into the list, all not getting along. But they only work together when the, when the enemy of the enemy, of my enemy, is my friend. And Tim keeps mentioning that Jesus is going to Jerusalem, right? But you know, every year, since Jesus was, for argument's sake, we'll say 12, that he would have gone to Jerusalem for Passover. So it's probably been 20 years, maybe, maybe going on 21. So he might have been just on this road traveling along at this time with many other Passover travelers. You know, funny, it seems like a good place for the temple tax guys to catch folks along the way. Jesus has not said anywhere that he is heading to Jerusalem to confront those dang gum varmints. But the leadership is probably aware of his travel, and by this time with Passover coming, and they'll just wait until he arrives, because yes, they are plotting. You know, Tim mentions that Jesus is inviting his followers to see themselves as, as the sons and the daughters of the Most High, and I might have a different view on that. Um, because in context, we are talking about these people. And these people that Jesus was sent to first, these are the children of Israel. They are the chosen ones of God from that covenant with Abraham. They already are his children, those sons and daughters. These, these are the same people who will eventually become the first ones to follow the risen Messiah. They are the beginning of the fulfillment of more of the promise to Abraham. They are those sons and daughters. So 
So now I might add that we are the ones that are adopted into, grafted into this family. We only have that because of them. Maybe we need to understand that we're those sons and daughters. Because these very people that are gathered around listening to his teachings, right? Then they become confused and scared because they had an expectation, not without merit, that he would come as the Messiah Ben David role. And when really at that time it was the Messiah Ben Joseph role. But they will be the foundation of this declared time of this Jewish Messiah. The kingdom of God is now at hand. It's beginning. You know, there was an inference made that the Jews made it a cost to be a follower of God. And I think it's a bit misleading. It has never cost a shekel to follow God. Ever. The temple tax, it was a cost, but it's not in Torah. Nowhere is there a temple tax or a tabernacle tax, for that matter. Yes, there are tithes and offerings, and those are very much part of Torah, but not this tax. But those in Torah are very much part of being a member of that community. You know, I also kind of take exception to the point that Jesus didn't care what people thought of him. I, um, I truly believe it was the opposite. I think he very much cared. I think he loved them so much, and he very much wanted, he wanted them to feel that. He did care about those and how he came across and how he interacted with them. Um, you know, we see that time and time again in the healings and the teachings. He very much cared. So maybe a different way to look at it was that he was comfortable with those against him to have a skewed view of him. That uh, they would be the ones to twist his words or accuse him of things because they're trying to get him to act out of character. But he wouldn't. Because he very much cared how those people that were following were to see and possibly perceive his actions. And this seemed like a good example of that. Paying the tax. This is not the point to grandstand the system, to stick it to the man in the system. Because paying the tax, it's not a sin, it's a choice. And it's one that he chooses to pay over confrontation, especially at that time. So yes, I believe he very, very much cared, especially with those that were, these people were still struggling, and his disciples, to follow him. And I love our point to ponder. And I'm still going to stick with it because I think it's important. Make no judgments where you have no compassion. Again, make no judgments where you have no compassion. But thanks for being with us today on Outside the Class on the Dusty Feet.